just ask you to just continue to work on our hearts. Continue to work on our thought life. Teach us to think your thoughts, your way. And Lord, we just, we look for the hope that's in you and your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Calvary Chapel. You guys want to stand with us and just worship? I'm going to sing till my heart starts changing. Oh, I'm going to worship till I mean every word. Cause the way I feel And the fear I'm facing Doesn't change who you are Oh, what you deserve I give you my worship You still deserve it You're worthy, you're worthy You're worthy of my soul I'll pour out your praises in blessing and breaking. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my soul. I'm gonna live. Like my King is risen, gonna preach to my soul that you've already won. And even though I can't see it, I'm gonna keep believing that every promise you made is as good as done. I give you my worship. You still deserve it. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my soul. I'll pour out your praises in blessing and breaking. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of my soul. You're worthy. You're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy. When I sat by the hospital bed, you were worthy, and she could barely lift her head, you were worthy. After all those tears were shed, you were worthy. I'll never stop singing your praise. I'll never stop singing your praise. And in the blessing and the pain, you are worthy. Whether you say yes or no, wait, you're worthy. And through it all, just to say you are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise and when I finally see your face I'll cry lightly and when you wipe these tears away I'll cry worthy I'll prove every other name you are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise No, I'll never stop singing your praise I give you my worship You still deserve it You're worthy You're worthy you're worthy of 
my soul I pour out your praises in blessing and breaking you're worthy you're worthy you're worthy of my soul you're worthy you're worthy Jesus you're worthy of my soul you're worthy you're worthy forever worthy of my soul you're worthy you're worthy Jesus you're worthy of my soul you're worthy you're worthy and when I finally see your face I'll cry worthy and when you wipe these tears away I'll cry worthy above every other name you are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I give you my worship you still deserve it you're worthy you're worthy you're worthy of my song I'll pour out your praises in blessing and break and you're worthy you're worthy Jesus you're worthy of my song
aware of these afflictions eclipse my glory. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. 
Open the eyes of my heart Cause I wanna see Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, as I want to see you. As I want to see you. See you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy You open the eyes of my heart, Lord You open the eyes of Heart, I wanna see you. I wanna see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, cause I wanna see. I wanna see, see you high and lifted up, see you high and lifted up, you shining in the light of your glory, and pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Cause you are holy, holy, holy And I wanna see you Holy, holy, holy Holy, holy, holy Cause you are holy Church, there's a close friend of our, of our family. Uh, she lost her mother just a couple of days ago, and uh, she's here with us today in the, the service. And uh, I think the Lord put this on my spirit this morning. Some things didn't work out, and we had to push a song out of the set list. And, uh, but God works everything out for his good, amen, and he knows what he's doing. So I just wanted to lift her in prayer. And the regardless of our loved one is gone, whether it's a parent or a, or a spouse or a child, that we just got to hold on to that faith that God knows what he's doing and that there is in his grace and in his, in his glory, right? So I'm thankful to the good Lord that he put it in her spirit to join us this morning and just to, as an encouragement. We lift this song and we lift you up in this prayer, Sister Ray. 
and just to, you know, just keep that faith that your mother's no longer suffering, but she's dancing in heaven along with everybody else that he's called home. Amen. So if you guys just want to sing along with us, just a little bit. And we just lift this pain and lift the, and, and we bring the peace of God down to the service and down to her and to the family. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall, will I see, hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory. What will my heart be? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah. I can only imagine. Sing that one more time. That's the way it's going to be. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Or will I stand in your presence? And to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only Time, take your time. <laughs> Thank you, bro. I didn't know an ex Marine could be so sensitive. <laughs> Roy does a good job. Well, good morning. I hope it smells like barbecue around here. That's the new fragrance of the church, it's going to be from here on out. So we're a few weeks into the new year, and um, we know what season it is. Cowboy season. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. I think everybody in America knows what season it is. It's football season. It's the end of the season. But, you know, as, 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 as interesting as we all can kind of recognize it, <laughs> the real season we need to be recognizing is the season we're in spiritually. That's the, that's the season that's really important. That's the one that, you know, that's bigger than this season. Because there's going to be another season, maybe. At least cowboy fans hope there is. <laughs> there's always next year. You know what I mean? But, but not in God's timing. There's not always going to be a next year. That's the thing. It's not always going to be a next year. And our hearts go out to you, sister. To be absent from the body is 
to be present with the Lord. Present tense, present tense, happening now. It's, it's, it's a done deal. We've had several, several journey from this life to the next life on us here in the last year or so. You know, it just, it just it never ends, right? Life and death, that's, 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 that's what it is. But. So we are studying the book of Luke, chapter 22. If you want to turn there with us, we are at the very end of Jesus' life, earthly life, but definitely not the end of his life, thank God. But the end of his earthly life. And... Um, There's just, there's, there's always, there's, there's so much to, um, to just open up and there's so much to, to discover, you know, and I, 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 I get the privilege of being the one to discover something and bringing it to the, bringing it to the plate, you know, each Sunday or each Wednesday. And so I'm responsible for going and finding some things that, that, that speak to me. I'm, I, I mean, I want it to speak to me and come alive to me and then I want to share with you what I've discovered, to see if maybe we see the same thing. And I think that's kind of how we've developed our relationship over the years is we've, we've been doing that sort of thing. I'll, I'll study some things and bring to the table, and then we'll, you'll hear me, and then it'll resonate, and you'll go, man, you know, that's what I need to hear. That's where I'm at. I'm, I'm walking this out with you. And, and so today it's interesting because we've watched Jesus walk his disciples for, for, for three years. Now, they weren't all with him for the complete three years. He kind of picked them up along the way. But still, over the course of three years, we've seen his teaching. And, and all, we, all we get is very, very little bit of information for, from the early life before he, he was baptized. And... Um, but those three years, there's, there's so much there. There's so much for our lives. And, and the interesting thing is no matter where our lives are at today, no matter what part of culture we're in or what, 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 what financial bracket we're in or even where we're married, single, or, or this or that, divorce, it doesn't matter. There is something for all of us all in here to, to, carry, us, to carry us through this crazy thing we call life. It's very crazy. It's, cra- it's funny because in the church, you hear the craziest stuff. People think I'm a priest. And they want to confess some things to me. I don't want to hear. And I don't appreciate hearing sometimes. But I understand the position that we're in. I under- uh, you know, and, and, and I understand the need for people to confess. I understand the need for people to come clean. And, and for that, I, beyond what I'm thinking as a human, I'll listen to you confess. Matter of fact, I want you to confess. I want you to, because I know what confession does, man. It, it, you come clean there. You know, part of my testimony is, you know, I had this vision when I, before I was saved that I, that I was in God's presence and, and, and just in his presence. I know we sang this song, what will we do and when we're in the glory? Let me tell you, in my vision, I didn't see him, I didn't hear him, but I knew I was in his presence and all I knew, I was done. That's all I knew. I just knew I was done. I can't even explain how you feel that way. But in, in all the greatness of doneness, in the presence of God, that's where it happens. Complete doneness happens in his presence. We bring nothing to the table. We bring nothing to the, we bring nothing to the party. We bring nothing to the relationship. We bring nothing to it but brokenness and hypocrisy and stumbleness and just, just all kind of, we're all messy. That's why we have a sign over the door that says, Lord, bless this mess because we are messy. This morning, we're going to look at, the, we're going to look at Peter. God gets to Peter. The Lord gets to Peter. So let's, let me just, let me pray. Lord, I can't imagine what the apostles went through. I can't imagine 
the anxiety and the tension of the atmosphere that was in front of them. I mean, they witnessed the healing, they witnessed the resurrection. Peter walked on water, we saw these great things, but Lord, they're about to witness and be, and be a part of a process that has to take place, the darkest, the darkest moment in history is about to take place. But it's going to be the last opportunity for darkness to be that dark. And the disciples, Lord, may we learn, may we learn something from their lives and their relationship with you that we can carry in this century, in this day and age, in this time that we're living in, in the days that were in front of us, Lord. May we know May we understand and may we hear in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, as Jesus is leaving the Passover and the communion, he's walking to the garden and he's on his way to pray and get arrested. The the disciples spoke and we talked about it last week. They spoke among themselves about who's the greatest and we talked about who's the greatest. I showed you graphs on different cultures around the world that, you know, the peasants are at the bottom, the slaves, and then the the masters, and then the dealers, and the priests, and then the king. And the priests were always at the top. Because the priests are always the greatest next to the top because they always speak to the ear of the king. And so there's a great prominence of being there. I mean, even now, you know, pastors get with presidents, and there's always sheiks around, uh, uh, or or whatever they're called. Anyways, people, people use religion for for this, for power. And, and the disciples understand that because they see it, they, they see that crazy hypocrisy in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they see it. But yet they're wanting some of that. And the Lord is trying to say, that's what the Gentiles do. And he's, you know, correcting them and trying to put them in place. But at the same time, there may be a place for the business that they were talking about going down the road. But, but instead of Heading to the prayer meeting, they were trying to have a board meeting and trying to take care of business when there was really business ahead of them that they didn't understand. And listen, we have to understand this business before we can ever be in a board member business. I don't want board members that ain't walking this out. Because if you ain't walking this out, you're going to mess, we're going to fight over here. I promise you. And thank God we haven't had those issues going forward. <laughs> have a good board. I'm blessed. But then all of a sudden, and the Lord said, verse 31, as they're walking this journey out, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. That's very specific. That's, that's a very specific, that's a very specific, it's, it's very specific to hear because when you see the, when we go back to Job, the Lord brought Job's name up, right? Thank you, bro. I'm, I hate to use my Dallas Cowboy sleeves. <laughs> I don't want to put it. <laughs> He said, I'm probably going to use my sleeves later (laughs) when they play Florida. But isn't it interesting that it's very specific? Why Peter? Why why, why Peter? Why not all of them? I mean, he has minions. It's not like Satan's going to do it himself, maybe, you know. But here's the deal. He's a target because he's on the side of the Lord. I don't like being a target. (laughs) Who likes being a target? You're all targets, though. Every single one of you are a target. Every one of us are targets. But this is the deal. Is isn't it great that that, that this is what this is what say that's what the Lord says. The Lord gives Peter a heads up. When he gives Peter a heads up, I want to put my head up and go. Me too. Because watch out, watch out, watch, watch Peter's attitude. 
Simon, Simon, he says his name twice. Indeed, Satan has asked for you. Is there talking about greatness? Indeed, he's asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. That means cunningly just work his way through you. But I have prayed for you. Listen to what the Lord says. But I have prayed for you. Think about that. How many people have you called to ask to pray for you? How many people you call out and ask to pray for you? We have prayer requests on our cards. We pray for you. We have a prayer team faithfully for how many years now? Every Monday night. That's why we're successful because of prayer. And the group of people that meet and fellowship and pray every Monday night. Prayer changes things. The Lord prayed for us. As he's going to pray in the garden. But listen to this. He, He continues forever. Has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save us to the inner, inner, uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them, always available in between us when Satan is coming at us and you're allowing him to. The Lord is still pursuing intercession for you. He's still keeping you covered in his blood as you're stumbling backwards sometimes. Thank God. God, you don't lose your salvation that easy. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, saying in heaven, now salvation is streaked in the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Listen, that's future tense. Because look what it says down here. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, for he has having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. He has wrath. He is not playing around. He is here to destroy relationships, hopes, dreams, lives. He's, he wants to destroy you to the uttermost. He wants to take everything you hold valuable from you. You understand that, right? He wants to take your livelihood. He wants to take your joy. He wants to take your health. That's what he does, kill, steal, and destroy. He is a sign. He has nothing else on his plate. There's no other purpose for his existence at this point but to come at us. But for some reason, in this thing we call life, there's a purpose. There's a plan. I don't understand it. I don't get it. Neither do you. But something within us that he created and and birthed in us, he put that that there. And, and, And those of us who've recognized and connected with him, boy, Man, my life, my world has turned completely different. But I prayed for you that your faith should not fail when you have returned to me, strengthened your brethren. What? What? When you return, where's he going? Where's he going? Well, we know the story, the furthest he got was fishing. But what he says was when he turned away from where he was headed, because he was headed to do everything the Lord said, but then life got in the way. It sure didn't play out the way he thought it was going to play out. All those disciples thought they were getting worldly thrown. They thought they were going to walk from the shepherd's fields or wherever they came from, the, the, the fishing, the, the little softies like Andrew, I don't know, the, 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 wherever they came from, they were all going to have, thought they were going to have to go back there. So, we, we, so there's, a turn, there's something happens. Strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, listen to what he says. Lord, do you know who you're talking to? 
That's what he said. Lord, do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to Albert Fuentes, man. You know who you're talking to. You're talking to foo. <laughs> exactly. Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Now, now here's the thing. The good thing is he was willing to prove it because when they come and arrest Jesus, he pulls the sword out and he cuts his ear off. So, and it tells us he cuts his right ear off. So, assuming he's right-handed, he cut him from behind. Which, if he's running to attack the Lord, that's where you're going to shoot him. Or that's where you're going to get him before he gets there. But anyways, he got him. He was willing to pull the sword out and fight soldiers. I can appreciate that. I can appreciate those kind of guts. I mean, I was raised to have guts. I can appreciate a man that's willing to go and fight for what he believes in. I'm talking about really fight. I love that kind of guy. I'm that kind of guy. I was raised to be that kind of guy. And spiritually, I understand the kind of guy I'm supposed to be. But I don't use these no more. I don't, I don't use these no more because I'm older. <laughs> or else I would use these more. If I needed to, I'm just saying. I recognize. I'm not in construction no more. I'm in brisketing. <laughs> so Peter, to a certain degree, I think the first part, he was willing to do it because he pulled the sword out. And you know if you pull the sword out, somebody's going to pull the sword out. Somebody could die. So he's willing to die. But when he's willing to go to prison... He didn't want to go there. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. God, oh, man. That had to sting. You know, in the beginning of my Christian walk, I was pretty arrogant. I was very arrogant. I was like the high beams. Couldn't see, anybody could see coming at me. I was blinding them. I was, so, I was so intense. I was so radical and so everybody's going to hell around me, that kind of guy. Everybody was going to hell around me. Everybody. There was nobody walking out like I was walking out. I couldn't understand why nobody was walking out like me. Like the church was telling me everybody was supposed to walk it out. But when I learned how God told me to walk it out, put my low beams down, <laughs> went back to low beams, kept to myself, and just lived my life out and just began becoming an example. And then as God gave opportunity, I share my story, which it's a godly story, how I got saved. And so then I'd share my story, and then people would, hey, that's interesting. And then as I continued and they see me progress and go from being a tile setter now to a pastor and just the, the, how my life has been changing and now I'm a brisketeer. It's a testimony to the Lord. It's a testimony to the Lord of what he can do with somebody's life that's just willing to just go, Lord, take me somewhere. I'm willing to go where I went. I've, I've knocked on doors. Just I've, I've, I did Jehovah's Witness stuff. I'm here with Calvary. I mean, with the church, the open door. We want to invite you to the church. We're new in the neighborhood. I didn't know Jehovah's Witness had a lock on that. I just knew I was saved, and I wanted to go tell people about Jesus. So every time I went to the door, I thought I was Jehovah's Witness. I didn't understand why they would, they would push me away so quick. You know what I mean? Anyways, I'd go to the streets of Valley Mills back in the 90s, early 90s, and walk up and down there and talk to the young people about the Lord. I mean, I was zealous. I, I, was, I, I, just, I didn't think that I could go wrong and how wrong I was. And it wasn't that I was going back to sin. It was just I became arrogant. I became cocky. I, became just, I just became religious. I just, I just started trying to hold everybody up to a, to, a, to a place that they could not live up to in my eyes. And, and, and thank God I learned grace. Thank God I learned patience. Thank God I learned these things because your process don't look like my process. My process is completely different. Peter's process is different. But there are some things I think that I wanted to learn about Peter, and I wanted to share with you some things about a man. We're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Peter, 
as just a man that God called. Any old guy, a regular guy, he was a fisherman. His brother was a little spiritual, but he was just a fisherman. All he did for his, for his life was fish. That was his calling in life, and that's what he was doing when he met the Lord. Peter is going to deny the Lord. And it's interesting because he's going to deny the Lord that um, it, it's, it's sometimes easier to bear a great load for Christ than a small one. Some of us could be martyrs at the stake more easily than confessors among our sneering neighbors. And I think that's true. I think that's true sometimes in our Christianity, but, it, but we're also part of the process. And so the process is maybe to get you there to understand your responsibility as a believer. And listen, if you're not a believer today and you're, you, you haven't seen Christ the way it seems like I'm sounding like I'm, I'm receiving him, let me just say, just keep asking yourself, is there more? Is there more? Is there really a God? And if there really is a God, how would he speak to me? Where would he speak to me? And, and for me, that journey led me, yes, men were speaking to me, but I knew that men were quoting this book. And so eventually I put, picked the book up and began to learn to study for myself, listen to different teachers, listen to different perspectives, and then begin to come to my own way of, of how I saw Christ for me, for, 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 for my journey. And I've had to learn and, and be broken and be my feelings hurt and have to go through all kind of things of, you know, people leaving and, and, and different things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm going to be just me and him. Giving an account to him. It's not like he's going to make me come back and give an account to you first. Thank God. But it's going to make me come to him. And give an account. And that's all that matters. And it shouldn't matter to each of you. You don't have to give an account to me, Jason. The Lord is who you're responsible to. And he says, I tell you. And then he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now he, he who has a money bag, let him take it and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Interesting, ain't it? For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And then he quotes this verse. And he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. Peter said, give me one of them. <laughs> and he said to them, it is enough. Now, it's interesting that before when he sent him out, he didn't send him, he sent him out with nothing. And this time he's telling them to take everything. Because there's, there's a process. There's a time. That time he was teaching them one thing. Now he's teaching them a completely different thing that says, listen, you have to be responsible for your part now. Before I took full responsibility, I was teaching you some things, and there are going to be some things you're not responsible for, and you're going to have to discern what they are. And then there are going to be some things you are responsible for, and you're going to have to learn what they are. Right? Because there are some things I am responsible for. And there are some things I'm not responsible for. For instance, I'm responsible to tell you the truth. I'm not responsible if you walk that truth out or not. It's I'm not responsible to go behind you and make sure you're keeping it up. Now, if you have a Facebook, I'll stalk you. And then I'll use you in a sermon. <laughs> because if you put it on Facebook, you're, you're anybody's stuff, right? Anyway. Um, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And he being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and he came to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Interesting scene of events here as this is unfolding before us. I like that the Lord is praying. And, and, um, but the interesting thing about that cup is when we, these are just little tidbits. Is in, the, in the Old Testament, it tells us about that cup. For in the hand of the Lord, there's a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely the dregs of all the wicked of the earth Drain and drink it down. Now, what's reserved for the him, he's taken. He's in a garden, right? He's in a garden. Now, think about this. Adam and Eve were in a garden when Adam lost it all. When sin entered, when darkness entered the world, it was in a garden. Tonight in Gethsemane, where Jesus is at, is a garden where he's about to change things. It's going to get as dark as, like I said, it's going to get as dark as it can get at this moment. And then when Christ goes to the cross, it tells us later, if Satan would have known what crucifying Jesus would accomplish, he would have never crucified him. Think about that thought. If Satan would have known what he was accomplishing, he knew what he was doing, he thought he was doing, But there was a cup that the Lord had been putting out there this whole time. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. So that cup is something. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, take this wine, cup of of fury from my hand. So the Lord understands what he's about to suffer for our sake. And and we see this, listen, this is God. The judge becoming God, the punishee, so that you don't have to be punished. Think about that. This is the, the, the standard holder coming down and taking our place. That is, what other religion comes even close to that? Every other religion, there's work involved. There's sacrifice on your part. There's sacrifice for real. There's, there's requirements on your part. Ours is the only religion in the world where our king, our God, our creator died for us. Did you know, I didn't realize this until I was just doing these studies, that the name of God without the vows in it is the original word for his name, and it's not even a word. It's more of a sound. And did you know that the sound of his name is actually the breath out and the breath back in? That's his name. Is your breath out and your breath back in. That's his name. The breath of God breathed on the face of the earth, right? Creation. What better sense that his name would be the very breath? Because when Satan tries to stop your breath with sickness... You can't praise the Lord. You can't confess his name. Every breath you take says his name. You don't even know it. You're praising him with every breath. But when you realize and and then consciously turn your breath to an unconscious praise of the Lord, that's how his name is even sweeter, is in the words of your testimony. The words of your praise to him. Peter's going to get there, but it's going to be a process. Let's read. When he, okay. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them drew near to kiss him, drew near to Jesus to kiss him. So there's there's a huge crowd coming with torches. 
They're coming to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't stand out. <laughs> he doesn't stand out. That's why Judas has to go and do this horrendous thing. So Judas is kind of in the front. And they're kind of following Judas because Judas knew where he'd go to pray. Think about that. Where he would go to have his most intimate moment with the Lord is where Satan caught him. One of the twelve went before them, drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas... Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Can you imagine those words are still ringing out in his wicked ears in his eternal punishment? That's horrible to think about. When those around him saw what was going on, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. That's why I got this scripture right here. Look, it tells us. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And listen to this. The servant's name was Malchus. I bet Malchus became a Christian that day. And then Jesus, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? And then he tells him, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He didn't say you couldn't have a sword. He didn't say you couldn't defend yourself with that sword because he told him to get swords. He just said, you don't live by that sword. You live by truth and justice and righteousness. And when that sword needs to be wielded, you better unsheathe it. (laughs) All you gunslingers, amen. Okay. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as an against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Yep, the darkest hour. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed a distance. And now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them, trying to blend in. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, woman, I do not even know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And about an hour had passed, another confidently confirmed, saying, Surely this man also was with him, for he is also a Galilean. But Peter said to him, Man, I do not know what you're saying. And here's the thing is Mark tells us, I believe, I don't know if I have that scripture. Yeah. Mark tells us that um, he cussed. He cussed and says, Blankety blank, I don't know that guy. To put distance between him and Jesus at that moment. That's, that's, I think that's the moment that took him to the point where he turned. That he's got to be returned back from. So Peter is in an interesting position because that crow's about to do his thing. Watch. This is Dwight and Richard. And the Lord it said, and Peter said, "Man, I do not know what you're saying." And, he, and immediately, while he was still speaking, think about that. Maybe that last word he said was a cuss word. The rooster croaked. How quickly he forgot! And the Lord, listen. This is the this is the this is the toughest part. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. (laughs) Holy smokes. I've been there. Have you been there? Have you been there where you felt like you really just 
No coming back from it, almost. And then, and then can you imagine every time he hears, hears a rooster crow for the rest of his life? I don't care how good he's doing, <laughs> how positive things are going around him. I guarantee you Satan was kicking roosters in the, every time he was around, just, just making sure roosters were cock-a-doodle-doing all around Peter his whole life, man. How many people got him a cock-a-doodle-doodle clock? But you know what? I would do with that cockadoodle. I would get me a cockadoodle clock. And I go, you know what? That might remind me of what I did, but man, look where I'm at now. You know what I mean? I make my ringtone a cockadoodle do. Because when you fully are grasping who the Lord is and how he does bring you back from such a nasty way of pushing your way, self away from the Lord, cussing. I like to remember the Peter that walked on the water. It's funny because when you go say Peter walked on the water, all the pictures are showing him sinking. I finally found one where he was kind of on the water. I was like, man, he walked on water before he sank, man. Of course he sank. I mean, that's a good deal. But, man, he walked on the water. Who else has done that? I've told you many times, there's 11 other guys in that boat that didn't walk on water, and the opportunity was there's an invitation. I guarantee you all of them could have stepped down and said, I'm walking on that water too. Because there's missed opportunities. Peter did not miss an opportunity. And I like that about Peter. He didn't miss an opportunity to ask a question. And he was a real man. He was just like us. Matter of fact, uh, Paul says he, he's one of the pillars of the church. Talking about Peter. When, when, when Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians, he mentions that, that Cephas, which is Peter, is one of the pillars. It also lets us know that he was married. Do we not have a right to take a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, James and Cephas, Peter? They're all married. Come on, I can't be married. You're over here saying we should be married. So so we know he was married. So he had those issues. In John chapter 1, we meet him. And so we look at we look at how he started. One of the two heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He was a follower of John. Now he's a follower of Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon, which is Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, Peter, the stone. Changed his name when he first met him. But he don't follow him right then. So later on, a a while later, he goes when he's fishing. And it says, but Simon answered, said to him when he says, go back out and fish some more. Trust me. And, And this is what Simon Peter says. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. So we see that Peter is becoming a believer. He's slowly trying to become a believer. He wants to believe what's being told to him by by the Lord. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled both the boats... So that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That was true. He's the first one to come and just be broken like that and recognize the holiness of, the, of who was before him. And he recognized, he fell down, and, and he even says, Depart from me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. He says that. And then it's interesting that later on in the, in the book of Acts, when he's fully Peter, and he's already done some great things as Peter the apostle, the Lord brings that sheet, sheet of food down to him. Remember that? And the Lord says, rise and eat, Peter. And he goes, Lord, I've never eaten none of that stuff. Ever since I was a kid, I've never ate that. Even though I'm a sinful man, I'm cussing like a sailor. I was a good Jewish boy on this side, Lord. Let me tell you something. You get no credit for being a good Jewish boy. You get no good credit for being a good Jewish Christian kid. You get no credit. You get credit by being and doing. That's what we do. For all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish. And look at the bottom. They all forsook and followed him. So he was one of the ones that just gave up everything. So we see this intensity in Peter. 
Peter was one of the ones that asked questions. He was just inquisitive. Then Peter came to me and said, Lord, how often should I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times because the Lord's talking about forgiveness. And back then it was a few times you were to forgive somebody legally. <laughs> and Peter kind of ups it up just a little bit to see if he's a little bit more, you know, sound a little bit more spiritual and religious. And the Lord said, oh, Peter, not just seven times, but seven times 70. But I, I appreciate the fact that Peter was inquisitive about the things of the Lord. Then Peter answered and said that he's the first one that says, tell us, Lord, what does that mean? When the rich young ruler, when the Lord had to send him away because he, he wouldn't give it all and follow the Lord. Remember, he wanted to hang on to his... And so the guys are going, well, who can follow you, Lord? We've given up everything. And the Lord says, because Peter says, we've given up everything for you, Lord. And the Lord tells him, you shall receive a hundredfold. So Peter's getting all this information, but think about this moment that he's let the Lord down. After all these great things that Peter does, and he asked the first one to confess who Christ is. And he said to him, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The first one to just jump out and say the truth. Listen, if this guy can fail so horrendously, so can you. So can I. We are, all in a, we are all in a world that's very easily to get tangled up in. We all live in a world that there are, th there are things sneaking up on us in our society and in our culture. We have no idea are sneaking up on us through technology, through finance, through the system at hand, the government system, <laughs> politics. Listen... It's, 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 it's out of our control. But there are things that are in our control. And the things that are in our control is to understand who the Lord is in our lives. And what the Lord wants to do through our lives. We are a living testimony. We are to be a living testimony. You don't wait till you've retired to be a living testimony. You don't wait until you're married to be a living testimony. You don't wait to be a living testimony. You are a living testimony. You're either testifying of good stuff or you're shouting of stinky stuff. You're a testimony to something every day. Every moment of your life, every breath of your existence, we are testimonies of who God has created us to be, and it's up to us and the Holy Spirit, of course, who will help guide us and, and help make it make sense on the inside, right? He's the one that kind of puts it all together. We can do this. At the very end, there was a death. Jairus' daughter and the Lord let Peter go in and two other disciples, James and John, go in and see this miracle. Sometimes we don't all get to go in there. We don't all get to be a part of things. We just have to just sit back, listen, but God is doing something. And then he took him to the mountain where Moses and Elijah showed up. And Peter's in this great, so, so imagine, God is doing all these great things inside of Peter, and then all of a sudden, Peter just denied the Lord, and then when he denied the Lord, the Lord looked at him. I, I, I just, it was, it'd be one thing when he heard the rooster crow to remember what the Lord said, but it'd be a whole other thing to have the Lord look up at that moment. And... and, and Catch your eye at the moment you knew you let him down. The moment you knew <laughs> But you know the good thing is at the very end, Peter's when the Lord comes back and on the third day he's rose again and the Marys are at the at the tomb. Let me see if I have that scripture. Yeah. They get to the tomb, and it says, entering the tomb, they saw a young man 
clothed in white robes, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter. You know, when I, when, I, when I read that, personally, I imagine the Lord saying my name. Tell Albert. I got him. going to be all right. I'm going to get through this. It's, it's not over. It's, there's, there's more to come. There's, 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 there's more. But the Lord took them. To me, that just shows so, how tender he is, man. I mean, he cares about the human heart of this man, Peter. He cares about his human heart. He cares, and he's a fisherman. He cares about it. He cares that he feels so bad. He cares that he, that he, but he, but the Lord says, I know you, Peter. I know what you're going to do. And I still called you. That's what you have to look forward to is he knows who you are. He's called you for, if you're in here, whether or not you believe or not, you have called to be here. There's nothing special in this church today. There's no brisket here today. So that's not why you came. I pray that you came because you you, you wanted to hear from the Lord. You want the Lord to, to do a work in your life. You want to be different, don't you? I do. I want to be different. I want every day to be, I want to see every day different. I'm tired of the same flat tires. Aren't you? And when you get tired of the same flat tires, you'll do the work you have to do so that you don't have to keep having flat tires. You'll do the work. I'm going to finish up here. When I got saved, I was a nobody. You know, doing nobody things. Just nobody. When I got saved, I became somebody. And the reason when I, when I, when I say that, I mean that, that I became somebody the Lord noticed and somebody the Lord called. Not somebody in your eyes. I was somebody in his eyes. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh. What would that say to you? That would say not many wise according to uh, certificates, trophies. What, 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 would, what, would, what would wise in the flesh, smart, book wise? What does that mean? But it says not many of those kind of people. Not many mighty, not many people with courage, not many people that are willing to run to the fire, not many noble, it means you're not born to wealthy families, are called. Those three people not normally are called, but look what he says, but God has chosen the foolish things. (laughs) Hello. The foolish things. The foolish things, that is crazy to me, the foolish things. That's why we go to the prisons, right, David? God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. The wise come to you and go, man, there is no way you can do what you're doing. Wait a minute, are you just saying I can't do what I'm doing and I'm doing it? The wise will tell me there's no way that the guy with your background can go and do this. What do you mean? I'm doing it. The wise will tell you you're doing it wrong. Okay. Well, wrong is working. Let me tell you something. Me not being in a suit and tie is offensive to some people. It's offensive to have a cowboy shirt on the pulpit. 
right, to some churches. I guarantee you, if I got invited to a church, I wouldn't wear a cowboy shirt to them. But that's what makes us unique. That's what, that's what makes us, you know, at least me, because God called foolish things. And, 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 and if we, me wearing a cowboy shirt is really what throws you off, and you're not seeing what my hands and feet are doing. Well, you're the, you're the, like that guy that looks on the outside then. You know what I mean? That the Lord says, not everybody, you know, everybody looks on the outside. I look on the inside. And for the most of us, <laughs> he don't look at the outside of us. He looks at the inside. Just saying, thank God. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And here's what I love the best. And the base things, that's the things down here. That's, that's that thing, man, that you step in and want to get off. That's the base things. Those are the stinky things that God calls. God calls stinky people, man. He, he, he didn't call you stinky to stay stinky, I'm just telling you. Our job is to help walk you through the washing of the water of the word so that you don't stay stinky. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Thank you, Lord, for choosing jacked up, messed up people. Amen. Amen. If that's you this morning, if that's you this morning, you need to be thankful that you serve a good God. If you're jacked up in your thinking this morning and you know your mind's all over the place, you need to thank God that you have a patient God and you're still here. Because God is very patient. He's very long-suffering. He will work you through the process if you're willing to go through the process to get there. If you're willing to, to, to walk through the process, walk this thing out right, make good decisions, begin to walk away from the things that brought you backwards and took you down, begin to walk away from those things and, and walk in the light of what God has put before you, the place and path that you know you should walk and the thought life you should have and the patterns of habits you should have in your life. You know those things. You know what they're, they're, the healthy they are for you spiritually. Today's the day to make that choice because he's telling you, I choose people like you. And he's right in your yard right now. Knocking on your door, telling you, I see you, dummy, but I love you like you're not my number one child. I feel very loved by God. Sometimes I feel like he loves me more than he loves you, I'm just saying. <laughs> Let's pray. But if that's you this morning, look, we don't want you to leave here without an opportunity for somebody to love on you and pray for you. So if you just want some prayer this morning, I'm going to make it available to you with some of the prayer group. Come to the front and give you an opportunity to have them love on you this morning and pray for you and offer you um, their love and, and their words from the Lord. Lord, we just pray this morning. We pray that you deal with our hearts and those of us, Lord, who have been walking this life out, Lord, but maybe some have wandered. Maybe some have just let fear and doubt and anxieties just cause them to just give up and make bad choices. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of the process. Lord, that you, just like with Peter, Lord, you're working him through a process. And Father, may we see and understand your hands in that process. So Father, I pray for those this morning who feel they need prayer this morning. If that's you, you go ahead and come on up. And uh, we're going to put a little music on, and I'm going to pray for a couple more minutes. And, uh, and then as you're ready to slip on out, you just, you just go ahead and move. Lord, we just continue to just bask in your presence.